Okay, we'll make a start. Um, I'd like to officially welcome you to uh, St. Mary's University for our third um, symposium that's been delivered by the suite of football programmes uh, here at St. Mary's University. Um, we uh, have a, uh, the fourth one coming up at the, uh, on the 9th of May, um, and that will be in partnership with Chelsea Football Club Foundation and uh, International Women's Day, so uh, we'll give you more details about that at, at the end. Um, the idea of these symposiums, I guess, it is to challenge uh, current thinking. Um, program leader Tom Houtsell came up with the concept of uh, trying to challenge and, and identifying some of the problems that exist. Um, and so we, today we'll be looking at the problems that exist within the world of athletic development, um, particularly related to how we develop young football players uh, and related to obviously within an elite performance environment. We're really fortunate today, as you can see from the, um, uh, the list of speakers here, um, to have such a, an array, an eclectic mix of um, professionals uh, and academics and from a, a range of, of different experiences. Um, and I think that should be um, celebrated um, and officially thank those that have given up their precious time particularly those who work in both higher education and, and uh, professional sport, whereby time can be precious, particularly at this time of year. So um, it's a thank you f from me and the rest of the team for, for coming to give up your, your valuable time today. Um, I've no doubt that when the speakers uh, begin to discuss and, and present on their topics, you, you'll see such a fascinating um, array of themes that will, will be discussed. Um, so I'm going to kick off um, the session for today by trying to identify some of the problems um, that I th I've experienced over my, my last 15 years within um, uh, academy football and, and within higher education as well. And particularly, how do, we, uh, how do we challenge some of the ecological constraints that currently exist, uh, particularly with the generation of young people we're currently working with? So you've probably come across these two terms recently within um, within the media discussing the current generation of snowflakes and parents of snowplows. Uh, and I think about a couple of weeks ago the, the head teacher of one of the, uh, the local schools suggested that parents using WhatsApp groups were, were uh, being detrimental to their child's growth whereby they were, they were putting, um, they were effectively sweeping all the, the problems out of the way so they were chasing up on um, whether those uh, children had, had their homework due when it was due, when they, uh, whether they had P and so on. So one of the first challenges I think for me would be if we take the simple um, thought process that we need to, in order to develop physically, we need to make our players uncomfortable physically and, and we need to extend their, their physical range, how do we establish an environment that allows them to do that? Um, and when we use the term snow, snowflakes and snowplows, we are, I guess, um, making some sweeping generalisations. But I think over the years that, that I've been working in professional sport, there are more and more young people that we're working with that have reduced resilience that will give up when they are faced with uh, physical discomfort. Um, those of you who read uh, slightly bigger newspapers than, than the tabloids would have seen an article by uh, the Fulham manager, Scott Parker, who suggested that it's far too easy now to give up and move on to something else. I know as university lecturers we often talk about the Primark generation, where I can go and buy a t-shirt uh, for 2 99 chuck it in the bin once I've uh, been, uh, spent five days in Ibiza. And I think that's very similar to us. How do we create the environments within elite performance settings whereby we can challenge those young people to be physically, uh, physically uncomfortable so we can stretch them physically uh, and I guess for us not to act as snow plows um, and to make sure that the environments w w that we are creating are physically challenging um, and we don't allow um, any excuses for those players to, to drop out. The next challenge I think we've got is this rise in current research around um, the need for specialisation, uh, sorry, the need for diversification, particularly within uh, highly specialised environments. Um, 
current papers by sort of Cote and um, Martin Bridges and, and, and Toms uh, from Birmingham University have suggested that we're more likely to be successful within a variety of sports if the children have come from or have participated in multiple sports up until the age of 15. Now ecologically that wouldn't happen uh, and probably can't happen in, uh, within a football setting. Now if that's the case how do we then diversify those children's experiences particularly at a young age whereby yes they're, they're becoming highly specialised within their chosen sport but we enhance their movement vocabulary by um, by encouraging them to participate in, in a range of different activities within that environment that we establish. Some current um, research that uh, myself and colleagues are doing are looking at uh, participation levels of six and seven year olds within um, football academy development centres um, and some of those, the, some of the initial findings that we've got from that are, are quite frightening whereby six or seven year old will be participating in um, participating in probably 12 hours of, of one sport per week. So if they're signed with one club, or if they're in a development centre with one club, they're probably in a development centre with two or three clubs. Now if you take that as three times a week, you then add on, add on top they're probably training and playing for this school and a club side, that's six times a week that they're actually participating in one sport. Now if we look at it from a, a, a neurological perspective, although that participation in one sport is that necessarily best for them into over the, the duration of their potential um, athletic career. So again, I think a challenge for us working with some of those younger players is how do we establish and provide a, a diverse environment within a highly specialised um, setting. Um, so those of you who know, that's uh, um, probably one of the most popular personal trainers within uh, within the UK at the moment, Bradley Simmons. Um, Bradley was one of the first players that I coached. Um, he ended up not being a professional football player. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that's nothing to do with uh, any, any of my input. Um, the reason I put that example up there is that our young players today have got access to data and evidence and ideas around how they might develop their own athletic performance. Internally, they get access to GPS data, how they sleep. Um, they can then go home and access uh, videos online using um, a variety of social media models to, to pick up that information. So I would suggest our third challenge is how do we go beyond the what and the how and begin to teach the, the players the why? So any good athletic development curriculum would establish the why at the heart of, of their, any, their approach in how they work and deliver the programme to the young people they're working with. Effectively what I'm saying is that they can get the what and the how from, um, from a variety of sources outside of the, the environments that they're wor working in and developing in. So is it our job and responsibility to establish the why? So hopefully those challenges, I think, will be, um, hopefully some of them will be answered today in, uh, in the remaining talks. But maybe keep, it, um, keep in mind those three ideas uh, and how we might um, begin to develop ourselves in order to help the young people we're working with. <laughs>